great. I have a slide open on the screen in front, uh, behind me. This is the URL for our Google Drive. I am setting up this drive so that I have a place to transmit the slides to you uh, and to transmit the recordings that I'm making, both of the lectures and the practicals. Um, so those will all end up here for now. Um, I know that we have a more long-standing place to keep the audio recordings for all of the honors lectures. These will move to that location wherever that happens to be. So um, I hope that uh, this morning's tutorial was at least uh, a little bit hands-on. I realize it's going to be a little different since we don't all have the same software installed on our computers, but we will do the best we can. All right, let me open our slides for today. All right, you should, uh, you should have received the, the link to the drive and you should be able to grab the PDFs right out of the drive. Okay, it didn't arrive yet, so maybe my message to the honors mailing list has not been moderated favorably. Um, the secretaries are working on producing 10 printed copies of the PDFs, so hopefully they'll show up with uh, uh, the paperwork very shortly. All right. So this this lecture is focused on a lot of computer science concepts. Um, as this morning's as this morning's practical went, so will the lecture go. But I'm hopeful that in a kind of a formal talk, we can communicate a lot of the the reasons why we use these uh, these different properties from computer science, and a little bit more about their inner workings as well. So we're going to talk at first about metadata. Uh, we've talked a, a tiny bit about it when we looked at an assembly file that showed the experimental hierarchy to which a bunch of data uh, were mapped this morning. Um, we'll also talk about minimal information standards uh, in connection with that. From there, we'll talk about compression. We, uh, we've all heard of PKZIP, but, or WinZIP anyway, but we uh, would like to understand better how compression works and why it's so useful in the field of bioinformatics. Uh, from there, we're going to talk about complex data stores. Um, yes, XML is very powerful, but uh, having the ability to store data in uh, relational databases has been pretty essential to a large number of, of goals. And from there, we'll talk about high throughput sequencing, because there's, a, there's truly an alphabet soup of different formats that have been produced for high throughput sequencing. And I feel like it might be useful to kind of walk through that zoo and explain how they all connect to each other. All right. So we're going to start with metadata. This, is, uh, this gives us the ability to describe data. So first off, uh, you, you can think of metadata as experimental uh, descriptions. Uh, if, you're, if you're trying to figure out what data mean, having enough data to understand what the experiment was, how these data fit together, what kinds of experiments led to them, and so on, uh, is, is just essential. Frequently, when people post data to repositories, they include the final product, and they may include raw data of some sort, but they frequently don't give you enough information to figure out how we got from the raw data to their conclusions. They may not explain what kinds of statistical tests they used, they may not explain which version of software they used, how they configured the software, um, what their experimental design looked like, and so on. So the contextualization of results requires that we have some amount of metadata. If you talk to a, a, a grizzled old investigator in the field of biomedical sciences about metadata, the frequent answer you get is, just go read the paper, it's all in there. But we, we frequently find that people, even very experienced people, um, frequently leave these critical details out of the publications. So it's, it's an ongoing battle to, to get all the information we need to understand the experiments well. Okay. Uh, it, it's worth noting that people still refer to science as a fundamentally reproducible science, right? I mean, it, it's, it's that, that ha having seen a published paper that result is falsifiable. Someone can perform the same, the same steps that that person did in the paper, and if they don't get a similar outcome, or a perfectly identical outcome if they're doing something like you know, physics, then, uh, then that's, uh, that's a real problem. So being able to reproduce science means providing enough data to understand what someone did in very, very fine detail. When I was in elementary school, my, uh, my teachers once 
uh, showed the difficulty of writing explicit instructions. The, uh, the students were all asked to write down the instructions for how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, being as explicit and as clear as possible to, to uh, kind of our first foray in technical writing. So you can imagine a bunch of sixth graders all scribbling down, well, you get two pieces of bread and you slather peanut butter on one and jelly on the other, and then you mash them together and then you eat it, right? And so one of the teachers uh, performed these instructions with a real-life loaf of bread and a real-life bottle, bottle of peanut butter and jelly. Uh, and yeah, the stuff went everywhere based on these, the, 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 the explanations that people used. So precision and the uh, writing about your experiment so clearly that someone else can do exactly what you did is actually an extremely hard exercise and something that we should not take for granted. Technical writers have a lot of skills that frequently scientists do, do not have. So it's something we should all aspire to, great clarity in the protocols we lay out. Okay. Uh, and, and I want to point out that money is always hard to come by in science. And very, very frequently, we see that people will perform the experiment they can afford rather than the experiment that they are sure will uh, test their hypothesis sufficiently. So it, if you publish a, an experiment without enough information to reproduce it, in effect, you are, you're wasting that, cre that precious money. So being really um, very detail-oriented in, in how you log what you're doing along the way to your, ex to your experiment's success uh, matters tremendously. So I want you to examine uh, this, this case study that I'm showing you behind me on the screen uh, to illustrate kind of the problems of missing metadata. If I uh, run a series of experiments over at a systems biology core facility, frequently the data I get back don't tell me, or the, the file names that I get back don't tell me very much about where those raw data came from. Now, you as a new grad student in the lab uh, may be told that a postdoc who was here until about a year ago uh, ran a large series of experiments, and they produced these files. Um, but that paper isn't done yet, and we really need your help to, uh, to get this thing finished off. So I want you to imagine that what you've received back from, the, uh, back from this postdoc is that you've got a file called DT Vial 26, Vial 93, Vial 05, Vial 59, Vial 23, and Vial 85. Those names are not indicative of where they fit in an experimental hierarchy. Those just reflect that the, uh, the core facility that, process, that, that produced these data for me uh, received certain vials, and then they returned these data corresponding to those vials. If the postdoc hasn't even left us a note to say, oh, these all belong to the control cohort, and these all belong to the simulated cohort, uh, you're up a creek without a paddle. So that is a, that is a big reason why metadata are very, very useful. And what I'm showing here is just one of the, the most accessible types of metadata. They reflect the way that these files fit the experimental hierarchy. Does it tell us how much stimulation was used by TNF alpha in this case? Not, right? So this is the start of metadata. It is not the, it is not the culmination of all that you might expect uh, for making sense of these. All right. Now, we, we talked about EXIF as an example for metadata associated with photography. I'm a kind of a photography buff. You may see me around some of the department's events with my camera shooting away. Um, and so I thought it would be useful to, to have an example in real life of what these EXIF tags look like for a proper camera. So in this case, I have never entered into any system that what I have is a Canon EOS M2. But the camera writes that into every file it produces. It specifies uh, what, the, what the date and time were for the, for the moment when I took this photograph. It shows me the ISO settings. It specifies what, kinds of, what kind of lens I had attached, because I didn't realize that this was recorded there. But the, the camera knows what's connected to it, and it writes this information down. So these are examples of the kind of metadata that get associated with photographs. Um, this is the kind of detail that we would hope for when we have a mass spectrometry data set or a sequencer data set. Um, Generally speaking, most of the formats that have gone through a rigorous uh, testing process and, and consultative design process end up with a lot of information. 
Um, I, I used the example this morning of the MZML data format. This is one that was hammered out over five, ten years of, of discussion. It was very, very late, in fact, in when it was finally released to the public. But one of the very nice things about it is that that file format can include all kinds of details that the users do not include in their file names. For example, if you want to know the date on which, uh, the date and time on which this experiment was performed on the instrument, it's written in the MZML file. And that's really valuable when I, I do a lot of data archaeology in that people will give me large sets of data and say, we never managed to get this published. What can you suggest in, in putting this to, to press? And one of the first things I have to do is figure out where the lies are, because often the file dates that are given on MZML files reflect the file names reflect what's, what subgrouping these were supposed to belong to. And they don't actually reflect when the data were actually produced. So I end up sniffing the insides of these files to find out the order in which they were actually run. Frequently, uh, in a, a recent study, we were looking at sets of 24 fractions from uh, a common sample that had all been um, produced together. They were from one sample, they separated up to 24 fractions. And they had 24 raw files corresponding to them. And so I needed, I needed to sniff those files in order to find out that five of those files out of the 24 had all been run seven months later you know, on the mass spectrometer than the other, the other uh, 19 of them had been produced. If you look at the file names, that stuff isn't apparent. But if you are able to look inside the files to get some of this critical metadata, sometimes you can discover that's true. Sometimes you'll even find that people had multiple instruments to work with in their facilities and they ran 12 of the set over here and 12 of the set over here. Something like that can lead to technical variability that you might not uh, understand the source of if you didn't look at the metadata. So I'm, I'm going to say the word metadata a whole lot of times here, but metadata, in fact, are very useful to, to, to diagnosing you know, why we see certain effects in, in experiments. And it's certainly critical for us if we're trying to reproduce them. All right, hand in hand with that, we find minimal information standards. So Miami is one of these uh, standards that has been around for a while, uh, especially for people who are working in the microarray space. We're going to talk about microarrays um, in a whole lot more detail in a couple days, um, but I, I would just point them out as, as one of the assays we use to evaluate the degree of gene expression or the degree of genetic variability in a sample. So I, I wanted to read uh, this quote from uh, the, the paper, you can see that I've got URLs frequently or citations at the bottoms of these slides. I'm just going to explain where some of these quotes are coming from. So minimum information standards are sets of guidelines and formats for reporting data derived by specific high throughput methods. Their purpose is to ensure that data generated by these methods can be easily verified, analyzed, and interpreted by the wider scientific community. So how do these come into play? Generally, you will find that some group of scientists from a field that have been around the block a few times and know that people can really foul up the way they publish in this field, they get together, they discuss these minimal standards, and then they have a quick talk with funding agencies and with journals. And both of these are important because in the case of funding agencies, if funding agencies say your data must be made available and your methods must be reproducible if we're going to provide you money, then suddenly people who are writing proposals pay attention to that, right? So if a funding agency says there are these requirements upon you if you're accepting money from us, then people tend to pay more attention. The other group that we need to pay attention to are journal editors. If journal editors find that the community agrees that anyone publishing in this space needs to include this breadth of information, then people start paying attention because you as a grad student, when you write up your manuscript, you want it to be reviewed, first off, and you want it to be accepted on the second point. So, uh, generally speaking, it, it behooves you to know what the minimal information standards are in the field where you're trying to publish before you write that manuscript. If I try to write a manuscript about protein identification to uh, send to the Molecular and Cellular Proteomics Journal, they have a checklist that I, as an author, am responsible to go through and make sure each of these points has been answered in my manuscript. What happens if I send in my manuscript and I have not gone through that checklist? Does anyone know? You might say it fails review, but that answer is actually wrong. What happens is that a secretary at the journal sits down with my manuscript first 
and goes through the checklist for me. If she finds that the checklist hasn't been satisfied, the paper does not go for review <laughs> at all. It never hits the reviewers. It just gets canned right back to me. Within a week, I've got the manuscript back in my hands saying, you didn't read our instructions for authors. Do it right this time. And if I send it one more time with any of those items on the checklist missing, my manuscript is dead. So it really behooves you to pay attention to what journals expect in terms of minimal information standards when you're publishing. And that, of course, revolves around this concept of metadata. All right. So that's it for metadata for the moment. But now we can move to our next topic, compression. We're a long way from the time when uh, biology was a bunch of people running through fields with large butterfly nets. We, we're, we moved into a, a, a phase of our field where people rely on high throughput technologies to generate huge rings of data from samples. In the old days, proteomics might have meant running out the contents of the cell on a 2D gel to separate them on isoelectric, uh, the isoelectric points and molecular weights. And then I would have a snapshot of a gel to look at and say, look, there are all these proteins here. We have this one at this particular molecular weight. We think it's X. It's not how we operate anymore. We now generate tens of thousands of tandem mass spectra in the place of one gel. We now produce millions of sequencing reads from a single run of a, of a sequencer, not 24, not 96. So producing very, very large volumes of data is the name of the game. We must be able to compress these data. And, and so speaking about how we do compression, I think, will help to reveal kind of the inner, inner working, uh, inward workings of one of these key technologies that we use all the, all the time. I think, have you ever heard about, uh, about Huffman codes or run length encoding? Have you heard these terms? These are some of the basic things that we talk about in computer science when we want to understand how compression works. So we're going to spend a little time with those. So we're going to discuss um, we're going to discuss several formats, but we're also going to be looking at uh, the ability to handle lossy compression as well. So um, as, as we move along, we'll, we'll, we'll encounter different topics of, of, of this and, and move, move through that. I, I have a list at the bottom of this slide. Um, this is the kind of thing I might ask a quiz question about. I haven't written my questions for tomorrow yet, but. I just say, if I, if I write on a slide, recognize these formats, it, it probably behooves you to have a, a, good, a good memory on, on what it, each of those represent. We already encountered zip this morning. You can do that in, on any Windows computer. GZ is a gzip format. BZ2 is a, another Unix one called uh, from a block sorting method. Uh, and the last one is RAR. You sometimes see a lot of those used as well. Uh, we mentioned TAR in connection with GZ this morning. Uh, TAR is uh, one of those ways that you create a, a big unified archive before doing compression on it. All right. So to start, how do we represent the letters of the alphabet in binary? We all, we all hear that one of those sort of useless sayings that computers only know ones and zeros, right? But that's not actually that illustrative. So I'm, I'm hoping to pull back that curtain a little bit in the next two slides. We start with the fact that letters don't get stored in the computer. It stores bytes. And those bytes uh, need some way to be mapped to a letter. This is one of those things where there's no inherent way um, that, that suggests itself, that it's not obvious what this mapping should be. And so a large working group got together to talk through how we will universally code for letters and numbers uh, in, in the computer world. This has been around since, oh my goodness, I don't actually know the year. 1970s? Anyone? Long time back. In any case, um, this slide has several pieces that I want you to be comfortable with, so I'm going to try to walk through these. First off, we, we, as we said this morning, every byte includes eight bits. So how many different numbers can you code for in eight bits? So the first, the first number, we'll call it, is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 right? That's, a, that's our lowest number. That codes for 0. Uh, and as, I'm going to show a slide where I show counting in binary uh, later, so I'm not going to scoop myself just then. 
But the, the biggest number we can have for 8 bits is 1111, We've got two different, uh, two different values for each of 8 bits. So the total number of values you can code for in one byte is 256. That's 2 to the 8th. All right. So we have this space of 256 different values, well, 0 to 255, that we can map to letters in some way. How many letters do we have? 26 letters. Now, things get a lot messier once we start adding in like accents and stuff like that, or if you add in spaces and periods and commas and so on. So we need to leave room for that as well. But ASCII, this ASCII is the, the code that we use for mapping between letters and numbers, has developed this, uh, this set of, uh, of mappings. Now we, we start with a whole bunch of kind of nonsense things over here. In, uh, there's even a, in some versions of ASCII, you'll even find a, uh, a value for tolling the bell of, a, of the system. So if it encounters that, it's supposed to, t to make the, the bell on the computer system ring. It's been around a long time, what can I say? So I want you to sort of ignore these control codes over here. The first, the first 32 values that we see for ASCII don't really get used much in practice. But we do have a large number of universally used um, printable characters that appear. So we start up here with um, number 32 being the 33rd in the series, because we start with zero. This is another thing that shows up frequently in computer science. So space, uh, space on a, a, a one character space in your text maps to this value 32 in ASCII. So if you've got a, a series of bytes, it's going to visualize the, 30 second, uh, the, the, the value 32 as a single space. We have all these uh, characters that we use as punctuation that show up next. And then right here, we finally see that the capital alphabet starts at 65. The lowercase alphabet starts right over here. So you, we have different codes then for what maps to 65 and what maps to uh, the lowercase a. So in this table, we're, we're numbering our, our rows in hexadecimal. Hexadecimal. So hexadecimal is a 16 numeral um, counting system. So I count from, I go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's all very obvious, I think, to everyone. Then we go to A, B, C, D, E, F. What's the number that follows F in a hexadecimal counting system, though? Don't say G. It's not G. Remember, there are only 16 different, different uh, letters and, and numbers that are used. So what follows, what follows F in a hexadecimal counting system? What's that? Nine. It, it's not 9 because we've already used that. See, here's the 0th, here's the 9th value, here's the A, B, C, D, E, F. What you do is wrap around again. You, so the number after 9 is 10. In hexadecimal, the number after 9 is A. So the number after F is 10. So in each case, we substitute one of these letters A through F after 9. So the, the value after, the value after uh, 9, 9F, <laughs> I'm sorry, is, is A0. Because you can just set in, you get to include the letters A through F after 9 in the number system. So hexadecimal counting is not something that's going to be, uh, make a whole lot of sense, but I think you should be aware that it exists. We only use the numbers, maybe, maybe it's easier to talk about this in, uh, imagine that humans had evolved with 8 fingers instead of 10, right? Maybe we wouldn't have defaulted to using 10 as the base of our number system. So if I were counting with just eight fingers instead of ten, I would say, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then if I continued on from there, I would say 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 20. 
Uh, sorry, six, 16 would. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm getting myself confused at this point. So if you have, if you if you disallow any use of nine in your counting, or and any use of eight, then I guess you after seven you would have ten. <laughs> okay. So so hexadecimal is one of these ways that we that we deal with different numbers of of of, uh, of levels in any one digit essentially. The way that we map that then reflects this. So we wanted to know what the value that maps to capital A is. We have to multiply the column that it's in, 4, by 16 because there are 16 rows. And we add to it 1 because we're at the 1 row in the table. So 4 times 16 is? 64, very nice. 64 plus 1 is? 65. So just by looking at this table, you're able to jump directly to the numerical representation for a particular letter in ASCII, the most standard way of representing letters and numbers. Gosh, so... Oh. Sorry, I'm, I'm slightly lost. So you start counting uh, your columns at zero. Zero is your first... Yes, column. yes. Okay. In computer science, almost every table number of rows or number of columns is going to start with zero first. I realize I made a bit of a hash of the hexadecimal presentation. But yes. Do you always multiply by 16 and then add your row? We're multiplying by 16 in this case because there are 16 rows. If, if we show ASCII properly, we have, well, in this case, we have 128 values long. It doesn't fit very well on the slide. So here they're showing it in a tabular format and showing you how to compute the, the number for a particular position in that table. Since there are 16 rows here, we multiply by 16 for each column that we are to the right. Wouldn't there always be 16 rows because of that 0 to F? Yes. Yes. But sometimes you will see ASCII represented in a 10-row in a, a table, for example. Uh, okay. They did it here because it was actually designed around a base 16 thinking. Okay. Yeah. So we, we see, for example, that, uh, that, that, that two columns are taken up by these alphabets. And that's intentional because they were thinking around the hexadecimal representation of these numbers. The designers of ASCII were thinking in 16s, not 10s. 16 is uh, being able to represent a set of four bits as a, hexa as a single hexadecimal digit makes it nice and compact. In effect, the, when you have uh, one byte, eight bits in other words, you have FF total values <laughs> in hexadecimal. The, because the, 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 the hexadecimal equivalent to 256 decimal is FF. So 16 times 16 uh, is 256. So, yeah. it's, it's a little magical thinking, I'm afraid. But, so if I, were, if I were doing a quiz question about something like this, I'm much more likely to say, you know, is ASCII a, uh, wh which of the following is the best, is the, the most appropriate description of, the, of ASCII's role in computer science, right? So I might say, uh, it is a minimal information standard for sequencing experiments. Um, it is the mapping for letters to numbers used in all computer systems. Uh, and then I'd probably throw in something about F because you've heard me emphasize that point a whole lot. <laughs> so that's a kind of the kind of way that I map this to it. But ultimately, I want you to think that computers have standard ways of mapping letters to numbers. ASCII is one of the most common of those. Unicode uh, is rapidly becoming a highly valuable one as well. But the complexity of ASCII is nothing compared to that of Unicode. Being able to handle different alphabets, etc., is a really mind-blowing bit of business. All right, so I want you to imagine that we have a text message, right? Now, to the computer, it's a bunch of numbers, but to you, you look at it, it's a bunch of letters. I want you to imagine that that message is A, 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 blah, 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 B, 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 C, C. So how can you communicate that string as compactly as possible? 
For that, we're going to introduce the topic of run length encoding. This is the idea that if you have the same symbol appearing in a large number of repeats, you can more compactly express it by saying, we have this symbol this many times. All right, I think that, that should be relatively clear. So we can count and say, how many times does A appear? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then it stops. The next character is a B, so we're not going to go on to that. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So in run length encoding, I need to specify a symbol that I'm using, A in this case, and how many times it repeats, eight in this case. So when we encode this in run length encoding, we're going to specify that the symbol A appears eight times. Next, we're going to talk about the letter B, because that's the next one in this series. B, 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 B. So that was six, right? So the next, the, the next part that we include in our run length encoding is to say that the letter B appeared six times. But we're not done encoding the string yet. Now we have CC. So the last part of our run length encoded string says that the symbol C appears twice. All right, so what did we accomplish by that? How many bytes did we have to use for our original string? Sixteen, there's that number again. I tell you, a computer scientist made the slide. You can always tell they leave their 16 marks everywhere. All right, so we had 16 bytes to represent our original string. When we gave it in run length encoded format, how many, how many characters did we need? Or how many bytes did we need? Just six. So 16 down to six. That's a pretty good compression ratio, isn't it? So people sometimes say, what is the best compression you can possibly get? They sometimes ask this question. And the answer is always, well, it depends what you're trying, trying to compress. Imagine that you have 50 gigabytes of file that all correspond to the letter T repeated 50 million times, or 50, sorry, I said gigabytes, didn't I? 50 billion times. If you were compressing that, run length encoding takes you down to a pretty small number of bytes to represent that entire 50 gigs. But run length encoding is not that smart a, a coding system if you don't have a high degree of redundancy in your data file. So from time to time, you probably encounter images on the network um, uh, say, uh, line art diagrams, so something in black and white. So you might have some arrows and some text and so on, but there's an awful lot of white in, the, in this image with some black print on it. This, this kind of image is ideal for run length encoding because the number of white dots in a row is really huge. They don't have much information content, it's just a bunch of white dots in a row. So run length encoding is completely sufficient to take care of coding and compressing uh, these, these files. However, think about how much more difficult that gets when the image is instead grayscale. Now, instead of everything being either black or white, now there's a whole spectrum of brightness levels. Typically, in a grayscale image, there are 256 different shades of gray. Now, if you, especially if it's a, a black and white photograph, the number of times that any one grayscale uh, gray will be repeated between two pairs, uh, between a pair of dots is very small. Suddenly, run length encoding is not such a good option for compressing it. Okay? So, in the case of a document like this where we have a high degree of repeat going on, uh, run length encoding is our friend. Now, I'm going to ask you a tougher question. What happens in this case if the A's, B's, and C's are all mixed together. What if you had A, B, 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 A, A, C, C? Now run length encoding isn't such a good idea because we're alternating symbols. We don't have long runs of the same value. So run length encoding gets us a little bit of the way towards good compression, but it doesn't get us all of the way, and that's because Real-world data do not have huge numbers of repeats within them. Any questions on run length encoding? Okay. Now we're going to talk about a subject that I think is personally fascinating. 
This is Huffman codes. Huffman codes are one of the ways that we have used to represent that coding each letter by the same number of bits is a little, a little bit senseless, actually. So uh, we, might, we might say that ASCII is brilliant. It already codes for everything we need because every letter has its very own byte to report. That's grand. But uh, in fact, some letters appear far more frequently than do others. Now, I, uh, I ran over to Oxford Dictionaries, which had a, a little blog post on which letters are used most frequently. So they had gone through the entire dictionary that they, that they uh, house, uh, host and had asked how many times does each letter appear in each word. Now, this is a little different than the, the question uh, we, we started with, which letters are used most frequently. And, and the reason why I say that I, I, I've already cheated is that each word is not used with equal frequency. Can you imagine if our, if our language used each word in the dictionary with equal likelihood? The word obfuscate would be just as common as of. That would be very strange, right? So working from a, a very silly point of view, if we say every word is equally likely to appear in, the diction uh, in, in speech, we can ask which letters are most frequent. Okay, so we start with the letter E, which means that if you're ever playing Wheel of Fortune, E would be great, except that they make you pay for, uh, for uh, using E. Do they show Wheel of Fortune, the game show on TV here? Oh my goodness. All right, you've never seen Pat Sajak and, and Mana White doing the, the thing, they've got the, the, the common word or a uh, common phrase uh, with all the letters blacked out, and then you as a contestant must say which letter you want turned over. And your turn is over if you pick a letter that there aren't any of, right? So you're not going to pick Z as your first bet because Z is not that common a letter. But if it's a vowel, you have to buy it. You have to spend some of your prize money in order to get it. Sorry, I, I should have realized you guys wouldn't have seen Wheel of Fortune. That's such a shame. It's okay. So, the most common letters that you would see people uh, play in the game Wheel of Fortune are R, S, T, L, and N. Because the vowels are all, all common. So, when we look at the concise Oxford Dictionary, we see that the first consonant that shows up is indeed R. R is the third most frequently used letter, just under 8% of the time. Then we've got I, then we've got O, then we get T, that's the second most frequently used consonant. N, the third most likely, S and L. All right, so we've now charted a frequency of each of these letters. By this, it looks like using the letter Q on Wheel of Fortune is a pretty nonsense maneuver. Okay, so this tells us that our coding system in English should not spend the same number of bits on each letter. That letters like R are far more likely to be used and therefore should use fewer bits than letters like Q that are much rarer. So I've used a strategy called the Huffman code to build this diagram. The Huffman code is built around this idea that the symbols that appear most frequently should use the smallest number of bits in order to code for them. So I want you to, I, I, you should see that every yellow node here has a left branch and a right branch. I want you to think of the left branch as zero and the right branch as one. So we said that E was the most frequently used letter. So in a Huffman code, E is the only letter you see it's the only green one that appears on this row. E is the only letter, based on the, the concise English uh, Oxford Dictionary, whatever it was, um, that can be coded for in only three bits. So we have left, zero, right, one, left, zero. So in this Huffman code, the this, this string of, of, of binary bits 0, uh, sorry, was it 0, 1, 0 should be decoded as E. The let there are four letters that require far more bits to code. Those are J, Q, X, and Z. And to get there, we go 0, 0, 0, 
one, 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 and then it's either zero, zero, or one, one, or whatever to get to one of those. So you might say, well, then under ASCII circumstances, the number of bits that were required to code for each letter was eight. Did we do better or worse? I mean, what's our, what's our worst case performance using a Huffman code instead? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Our worst case result in the Huffman code is that we still have to spend eight bits to get to one of these least frequent letters. But the best result requires only three bits. So if we are to reproduce the number, the, the set of bits that respond to a particular message for this Huffman code, we can, we can, um, we can use far fewer bits than ASCII would require, uh, since the worst case result is the same as what ASCII requires. So if someone gave us a typical text, maybe they give us J, 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 J. Every one of those J's is going to require 8 bits here, or it's going to require 8 bits in ASCII. If we, on the other hand, have the text E, 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 every one of those E's is going to require only 3 bits, not 8. Okay, so Huffman codes are good. Now, there should be uh, an apparent hole in this argument. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if someone is going to pick up upon it. What we've done is to take advantage of the fact that the frequencies of individual letters enable us to code with fewer bits for some than we do for others. So what's the, what's the obvious counter to that? Actually, in this case, the, the whole premise of the Huffman code is that we want to spend as few bits as we can. Therefore, we're going to use fewer bits for the most frequent events. If what you're training on is not representative of the text you're actually going to apply the Huffman code to, though, you, you get substantially worse performance for doing so. Marissa has her, uh, her hand on her. How do you know when a character, after how many bits does a character in? Ah, oh, that's really interesting. The funny thing is you don't have to know. When you, when you get a string of zeros and ones that have been Huffman coded, you don't automatically know how many letters it codes for. You just start processing at the beginning, and any time you hit one of these green nodes, you're done. Right? So if you have 0, 1, 0, you've hit E. Then you have 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, for example. So 1, 1, 1, 1 is R, and then 0 is here. You just keep decoding bits from the stream until you hit a node. But and then you start at this root again. How do you know that you hit the node? The only, the only way a Huffman code makes sense is if you've got the tree with it. Because there's, there's any, if I, if I were to build the Huffman code from the letters used in Shakespeare, I get a different Huffman code than if I start from the whole dictionary. You have to hit a node because the letters won't continue. So if it was like one, 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 then like you would only get to a certain number. Yeah, four yeah. ones gets you to the letter R. There's, there's no pattern of bits that never hits a node. Because the, there's no case in which the terminal node is, is yellow. So, our, so you can only make sense of a series of bits if you have the Huffman code that belongs to them that tells you how to interpret the bit stream. And you can't just pick up in the, you know, halfway through the stream and start decoding it. Very messy, weird, huh? All right, cool. So the, the thing that is really missing when we talk about Huffman codes is that it is a letter-based compression. If you have letters that you want to compress, this is going to work just fine. The problem is that English is highly redundant at the word level. The, the words the, a, an, of, in, all of these are used terribly frequently. But Huffman doesn't let us do anything like that. Huffman is only going to compress at the letter of letter redundancy, not word redundancy. So ha finding good ways to, uh, 
to strategize the minimization of bits used per word are different than ways to minimize the number of bits per letter. All right. So run length encoding and Huffman codes help you to sort of get a glimpse of what kind of logic is used in computer science for enabling compression. All right. Now, once we get into the world of images and sound, the types of compression that we use no longer make use of a, a type of compression that allows you to completely reproduce the original. Perhaps you've, you've encountered this, that you'll, you'll download an MP3 of something and it sounds terrible, just terrible, right? I mean, it's got sort of a weird glassy ringing sound to it and the, the, the drums all sound flat and, and so on. This is an example of someone using too few bits to try to represent a very complex bit of music. So this is because the type of compression we use for our iPods, for our MP3s, for whatever we're, we're happening to do, is frequently a lossy compression. Similarly, you frequently will see people using images that they've used from online, for example, that, uh, that have been too badly compressed. There's, there's a, I, I frequently walk over to the Paro Center, the, the mall next door, and there's a haircut place right by the Portuguese fast food store. And every time I walk by there, I just wince a little bit because they've used an image for, the, for showing a particular haircut that has been compressed and recompressed and recompressed, and it, it looks terrible at this point. You can't really tell what the hairstyle is like. This is an example of something that shows up all the time uh, in, in science. You'll, you'll see people using images on their posters that you really wish they could have found an original form. Because we use lossy formats to store our video and our audio. Lossy formats allow us to use a much smaller number of bits than a perfect uh, a perfect copy of an image or a sound. There's a, a format called, uh, I believe, FLAC, that in, when you have a CD and you want to make a digital version of it, you can make a FLAC file that is, that is uh, slightly more compressed than the wave that you would get by just ripping the thing to a, a perfect copy. But FLAC files are much, much bigger than the corresponding MP3 files would be. And that's because MP3 knows that you're willing to sacrifice a small amount of sound quality to get a much, much smaller file. Does that make sense? JPEGs. We use cameras all the time to produce JPEGs. And JPEGs take advantage of the fact that our vision systems are not perfect in recognizing the degradation of an image. So when we make a JPEG, the JPEG encoding is taking advantage of the fact that you're not going to notice a little bit of compression, a little bit of loss of accuracy in this image if it squeezes it just right. It does this through a lossy process. So, in the case of JPEG and MPEG, we find that the people who analyze vision have found that our eyes are less sensitive to very slight color changes than they are to differences in brightness, luminance. So, chrominance is something that we just don't notice changes in very much. So I would, uh, if I may borrow this bag for just a moment, here we have a, a super dry Japan International. Would I notice if these letters were shown in navy rather than the dark cornflower blue that they are? My eyes are not very sensitive to this. My palate is not very sensitive to taste, I, but this is just because I'm an insensitive pig, I guess. But here we see that this color could be shifted just a little bit. What if, uh, what if the algorithm were to claim that this color and this color were actually the same color? It could save some space, right? So slight shifts in chrominance allow the, so allow the software to represent the image in fewer bits than it would uh, to do so unnoticeably. Now, if you analyze the original, say, BMP, for a file and compare that to the JPEG that's produced from it, will the computer be able to spot shifts in, <clears throat> in prominence between those two images? You betcha. You betcha, absolutely, no question. But our eyes give, uh, are not as discriminating as what the computer would be in analyzing the two images. So that gives 
the computer an option, uh, it gives the developers options to distort your original image slightly in order to squeeze it a whole lot. Now, something that is really critically important, and this is just a life skill moment, so I, I hope you'll indulge me. If you download a JPEG from the internet, open it in your text, open it in your vision, uh, uh, image editor, and add a caption to it, and resave it to JPEG, you need to know that the format loses quality every time you save as JPEG. It doesn't matter that it started as a JPEG. The fact that you're opening it, editing it, and resaving it distorts the image further. And JPEG upon JPEG upon JPEG starts to look terrible. So here we have an example of what happens when you go through too many resaves with a JPEG. Each compression is producing blocking or ringing or mosquitoes. So blocking is seen here. Her cheek is, appears nice and smooth in this image at the left. But in the image at the right, we see these jagged boundaries between different levels of gray that have shown up. That, that is an example of blocking. Ringing is another effect. Um, in JPEG, you, will, you, you may see a big contrast in brightness between one region and the region next to it. Say you're, uh, you know, you're, you're shooting from the shade of a, of a barn or whatever. You, you've got this nice dark image of the corner of the barn, and then this really bright image of the, the grass beyond it that, that produces this edge. JPEG is really susceptible to creating ringing, which leads to that edge sort of making ripples of contrast around it. It's not a very good thing. And the thing that really bugs me the most is mosquitoes. When you, when you look around the, the edge of someone's head on a photograph and you see these little distortions in the, the, the negative space around them, those are called mosquitoes. So, Resaving and saving and saving and saving uh, a, a JPEG image will lead to these problems worsening. So try, if at all possible, to do this lossy compression only once. That is really the best solution for it. Okay. Now that's nothing compared to the kind of distortions that we introduce in MP3s, or in QuickTime movies, or in AVI for that matter. These methods are all very, very um, efficient in the way that they use space, but they do a lot of distortion as a result. So this morning, I made a recording of the practical on my phone, and it stored it in M4A format. That stands for MPEG-4 audio. So if I were to say, well, you know, the other, the other files for this class are all MP3s, what, what do I do about the fact that this one is an M4A? Well, one of the things that is an option is that I can, I can translate this M4A recompress it to make an, M, M, sorry, an MP3 from it. Everyone knows what to do with an MP3. But doing so would lose quality. We would introduce some ringing effects and stuff like that of our own in making an MP3 from an M4A. So lossy compression is something you only want to do once for, for the life of any image or the life of any sound. All right. So let us talk about how to count in binary and how to translate those values back to decimal. You thought I was done with the hexadecimal, right? But I'm not. I have more to say on this subject. So let's talk about representing numbers in binary. The reason for this is that the, the values that we, that we store in the computer are almost always stored in one of these canonical types of, of uh, variables that we use. So a short integer is a number that doesn't have any, any part past the decimal point. That is normally stored in two bytes. A long integer is stored in four bytes. A float, we have to, we have to partition out. So a, a float is actually, um, sorry, 32 bits, which is four bytes. In this case, it's storing a bit for sine, a bit for the, uh, to, to talk about how, uh, what the power is on the power of 10, and then 23 bits for the part that's floating. So once we start talking about formats like that, things get rather complex rather quickly. But what I, would, what I would really like for you to understand is how to translate from a binary string of zeros and ones to the decimal value. This is a very useful life skill. It shows up in all kinds of contexts. So here at the top, I have shown the powers of two from two to the seventh down to two to the zeroth. 
what is the value of any number raised to the zeroth power? One. Very nice. Great. Okay. So pi to the zeroth, e to the zeroth, two to the zeroth. It doesn't matter. The value is always one for that. So this last place, if it's filled in, if we've got this colored in black, we're going to add one to the number. Two to the first power is two. Great. So if we have a one in this next to last column, we're going to add two to that value. What is two squared? Four. Very good. Great. So two to the, two squared to the second power is four. So if we have a one filled in this column, we're going to add four to that number. Two to the third is eight. Very nice. There it is. So if we've got a one here, we're going to add eight to this value. So when we count in binary, we only have two digits to work with. So we're going to start with zero, one. What comes after one? No, 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 not two, not two. We're not in decimal. Two does not exist in binary. So we went zero, one. What follows one? Zero. <laughs> zero follows it, but we add another digit. What is the other digit? I think I heard it. In counting in binary, 0 is followed by 1 is followed by 10. So let's look at it. I didn't show 0. I did show 1. Here's 1. Here's 10. So 10 has the value in decimal of 2. 11 has the value in decimal of 3. What follows 11 in binary? 100. 100 has the value of 4. So when you're counting in, in, in binary, you're, anytime you have values that are all 1s, you're going to replace those with zeros, tack, tack on a, a 1 at the head of it, and that's, that's the next number. So 0, 1, 10, 11, 100, 101, 110, 111, 1,000. That sounds really strange, doesn't it? But that's what it means to count in binary. And here you can see what the equivalent values are in base, in base 10, in decimal. OK, so that's how we code for integers in an unsigned, uh, in an unsigned uh, integer style. So if you have a short integer of two bytes, of two bytes, what is, well, let's, let's, let's start with one byte. What is the maximum value that you can code for with one unsigned byte? It's going to be the equivalent of 1111, 1111. What, what is the equivalent of that in decimal? Hint, it's on the slide. Thank you. 250, oh, sorry, 255 is the highest value. I always forget zero. Uh, is, the, is the first value, right? So 255 is the largest number I can account for in one byte. Now, if the short int is two bytes, that means that our, our largest binary value is 1111, 1111, 1111, 1111. That's the largest value you can code for. I'm, I'm ignoring sign for the moment, so let's leave that aside. What is the, what is the equivalent of that? in decimal. Wouldn't it be 255 times 2 or plus? Um, that's a good guess. But in fact, that's what you get for adding just one bit, not adding a whole byte. So yes, 512 is the largest value you can get in uh, 9 bits, but not in 16. Good guess, though. The answer is that you can count up to 2 to the 17th minus 1 with 16 bits. So this is, uh, this is the, the kind of counting that we do. Essentially, you don't think about there being a boundary between these two bytes. You just sort of mush them all together and treat them all as one set of bits. Okay. So that's, that's, what we're, that's what we're saying when we say computers 
deal with zeros and ones. They represent larger values by using more bits to represent them. All right. We've now moved out of the compression realm, moved out of the coding realm. Now we're discussing the storage of data in XML formats, the extensible markup language. Now I've got two examples here. Both of these uh, come from something called SGML, Structured Generalized Markup Language. That's okay. When we talk about HTML, we're thinking about a very basic set of tags that define how a text should appear. So, has everyone heard of the blink tag? The blink tag. Back in the early days of MySpace, people discovered that they could make their, uh, their web pages uh, draw eyes by causing certain text to appear and disappear and appear and disappear um, on, on, on some frequency. This was called the blink tag. So if you surround your text in a, an HTML page with the code blink and forward slash blink, that code will, will flash when it's rendered on your web browser. It's a terrible, terrible feature. But it's just the kind of example of things that people thought were a good idea that should be in HTML that they really shouldn't have. That's okay. So here, I have a very, very compact web document. This is an HTML document. The whole thing is surrounded by an HTML tag. That's how the browser knows this is an HTML. I know how to render this. Next, we have two sections inside that. We have a head section, and we have a body section. The only thing I've ever used the head section for is to give the title that appears at the top of the web, web browser pane when you've got this document open. So here I've called this Dave's page. So Dave's page appears at the top of the browser window when this is open. Inside the body, I have an H2 where I've written, Dave is awesome, because I think that should be in big letters, right? So H2 is the second size header at the, uh, that shows up in, in HTML. Inside that, I have a paragraph that starts at the open paragraph and stops at the closed paragraph. It says, this page is cool. But wait, cool has a tag on it as well. Those are brackets around I, which means that cool will be italicized. That's how we rule. All right. So, this is a set of all these different tags that HTML enables us to use to set apart our text. Okay, all good with that? This is a case in which a standards community has settled how the, uh, what tags shall be available, how they shall be interpreted by web browsers. XML is different because XML is designed for people to be able to define their very own standards for which tags are feasible. So when we look at a subsection of uh, an MZML, which is a, a, a subtype of XML, we see that we have several different tags available. We have a referenceable param group list with a count of two, which is its way of telling us that there are two of these types of things that are coming up shortly. We have the first one that is uh, a common instrument params. It is, it's defining what type of instrument has been used here. It works from something called a controlled vocabulary, which says that these terms and only these terms are defined for use within MZML. We also have a, a, a value of type 1,529. That, that is given as the instrument serial number. So here we have a whole set of tags that are just built around one thing. How do we express the output of a mass spectrometer instrument? And all of these values have been defined by this community as the way that we communicate information. So as you might imagine, there are lots of different, uh, lots of different data structures that have become available within the, within the scope of XML for making one text file, ostensibly just a text file, represent a very complex, uh, a very complex relationship among a set of information. Okay, so that is an example of XML. From there, we move to kind of a, a bit of a granddaddy topic. And this is something I was hoping we were getting, going to have more time to discuss this morning. This is the relational database. So relational databases are one of the best ways to make information scale well, meaning that you can throw huge amounts of information into the system, and index well to be able to uh, to retrieve information at a very uh, at a very rapid rate. 
The other thing that's really important to know about this is that relational databases are a very good way to represent data that are interlinked. So that instead of being forced into this Excel paradigm where you have, you have columns and you have rows and that's it, you have multiple tables that can interact with, uh, with each other in really interesting ways. So a lot of this was defined back in 1970. And I realize that may seem like the, you know, the ancient bowels of time, but I, I, I think to myself, well, I was born in 1973. So, I mean, I can't remember 1970, but I was, I was about to get there, right? So E.F. Codd uh, was the person who was kind of a mathematician. He was talking about ways that, uh, that you could create scalable systems that would be able to interrelate these tables. So he's kind of the father of the database. Now, IBM was uh, actually a really major company, uh, and they, uh, they felt like what EF Codd had put his, his finger on was just a really huge issue, that this was something that was going to govern how corporations handled their finances, how people managed their contact books, everything. So they created a language, a whole language called SQL. You'll, you'll see it called SQL. Don't be confused. Just call it SQL, and everyone will know you're an insider. So SQL was a language that would allow you to interact with these data stored in relational data types. So when we, when we say we're using a SQL database, that's not singling out any one particular product, right? So there's Microsoft SQL Server, for example. That is a specific database that is designed to work well with SQL queries. But almost any database out there, Fox Pro, MS Access, Paradox, whatever, these things all allow you to speak to them in the SQL language. So Microsoft Access is one of the most commonplace ones. Basically, anyone who installs Office Professional uh, from Microsoft has already installed Access on their computer. So lots of people have it out there. And I'd have to say it is one of the easiest of the database environments to get accustomed to, to work with. It has very good graphical tools for designing what tables you're going to work with, for specifying what kinds of relationships they have with each other, and so on. So MS Access is a very big deal. SQLite is a really kind of fascinating file format. Um, it, it is a library that enables you to write, uh, to write uh, queryable tables to individual files. So if you're using SQLite, you just connect your, your service code base to this library SQLite, and now you have the ability to write databases directly to disk. So SQLite is just one of the, the best tools out there when you're writing code to be able to incorporate a database in your system. MySQL is a very widely used open source database. PostgreSQL is another example. Uh, PostgreSQL, uh, I should say. Uh, and Oracle, of course, has, made, has built a huge corporation out of their ability to make databases that you can address in this way. So I'm actually going to give you an example of a SQL query in just a minute. But I wanted to show you an example of the kinds of relationships that we have among tables. This is small. I appreciate that. But here we have a history table. And each row of this table has a history ID, history date, contact reference, history type code, staff initials, history details, a follow-up date, and date actioned. Right? So this is a, those are the column headers for this table. And then there are rows of data that have been added that each have all of those fields populated. We have our contacts. This is probably a very easy table to understand. We have our contact reference ID. We have a full name, salutation, job title, company reference, address, postcode, contact type code, status code, filter code, contact notes, and date added. Right. So again, it's just a table where these are each the rows. You can imagine someone's name, how it might appear in here, how we got to know somebody, all sorts of things. The real power in a relational database comes from the relationship among these tables. I want to sort of draw your attention to how these are laid out. So here, for example, we have a company reference. And we see a little pip coming out of the side that links down here to companies. So we have people, and we have companies. And here we see that uh, there's a little one symbol here and an infinity symbol there. This is defining something we call a one-to-many relationship. That's a term that shows up all over the place in databases. So the way you might think of this is to say an, an individual company may relate to lots and lots of different employees. 
right? So we have a one-to-many relationship between a company reference and a contact. So we may have multiple people from the same company. So this is an example of the relationships that we see among different tables that will enable us to ask all kinds of different questions, query, and different kinds of information from this database. So there are plenty of, of definitions that would be very valuable to know in this space. I'm going to just start a, uh, try, try to walk through some of these. This uh, tutorial uh, on the SQL language gave me an example of the, this query for, from SQL. So let's start with an index. Every table in a database has some field that is used to index out uh, uh, some, some member of that table or some subset of those members. One, one example of this is when you receive a bill from a company, there's almost always an invoice number somewhere on that. And that invoice number is frequently very important to provide to the company when you're saying, my bill's too high, where, where are you stealing money from me? Or, I paid this already, don't you have it in your records? I have this reference number. Those, those identification numbers are almost always indexes into some sort of database that that company is keeping. So their ability to find the record you're contesting, the, the bill you're pro that you're contesting, hinges on their ability to find it. And so frequently having this invoice number is one of the ways that you can provide them something for rapid retrieval via an index from their database. Okay, next up, an inner join. That might sound like a very confusing term, but imagine that you have two different tables, like companies and employees, that relate to each other. You can align on a field that is held in common to both in an inner join. And the other term that we always throw about is query. So we have different kinds of information across multiple tables. We need to combine that in order to produce a coherent body of data. So from that, we can execute a join to do our query. So this is what SQL looks like. This is a, a pretty common type of query. I think that it, it will be a pretty easy one to, to parse. So we start with the fact that we are combining information from two different tables. One is called customers, one is called orders. We see that the customers ID field contains values that are the same as those that appear in the orders customer ID. So in our join, we specify that every record in customers that matches any record in orders in, in what values they have in these ID, ID or customer ID fields can be brought together. I, I frequently order computer parts from a company called Newegg. As a result, in their customer database, there's this David Tab guy, and in their orders database, they have a whole bunch of different product orders that I've placed that relate to me as a customer. So every time I go to their website and say, what have I ordered lately? Their database system is going to merge their customers and their orders, tape, uh, orders fields on my user ID and pull back all the orders that are in their database. Okay, in this case, the software is instructed to do an inner join, which means that every record in orders that relates to every record uh, in, uh, in customers, we're going to pull the information from the customer's file, and we're going to grab the identification number, the name of that person, the amount of the, uh, of the orders that have been produced, and the date on which those orders were produced. This is how you populate on these websites your list of recent orders, that sort of thing. So this is an example of a SQL query used to pull information from a relational database. Very powerful. Very frequently, this is something that we need for storing our research data. And because people don't have any familiarity with databases, they don't know to create them. But access is probably already installed on your computer. Why not use it? This is what it was for. There are a world of, uh, of of tutorials on how to do access database construction uh, available to you. Now this next topic is a slightly more complex one. This is really where we get into a, a more a computer science appraisal of, relation, uh, of relational databases. So I want you to think about this, this crazy little example that we've knocked together at the lower right. 
Imagine that you are trying to track student enrollment in a university in a table in Excel, right? So I have an ID number that I want to assign to a particular student. I have some location where that student lives, and I have the subject for which that student is enrolled. I've got a different ID number for each row of this, of this, uh, of this uh, file. So we see that Adam, Alex, and Stuart are the only students in our file. Adam is appearing twice, though, because he is taking both, both biology and physics. So we're going to talk about some of the problems in how these data are stored in a database. Why doing it this way is terrible. So there are three kinds of anomalies that we want to avoid in building a table of this sort. So we start with the update anomaly. Adding a record requires re-entry of extant data for consistency. 